This morning, Texas elections likely changed forever after what happened in Houston this month. The 34-year-old interim clerk from Harris County behind all those changes tells us what he now wants to do statewide. Election season, though, is not yet over. Shelly Luther is with us a month before voters go to the polls to decide whether to send her to the state Senate. Ron Simmons is the former Republican state rep who did away with straight ticket voting in Texas. And he has some thoughts this morning on the legislation that he led. And Texas Republicans in a public fight. Alan West, the party chairman, says he will not support Dade Phelan to become the next Speaker of the House. We're going to get into the politics behind it. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to you. We will begin our program catching you up on the top political headlines across our state this weekend. The chairman of the Republican Party of Texas, he made some news with TMZ the other day. Alan West told TMZ that President Trump has the right to look into voter fraud allegations. But West said if it's ruled a fair election, that Trump has to abide by that and he has to step aside. West made some more news we want to tell you about as well. This about the state legislature. State Rep Dade Phelan from Beaumont says he has the votes to become the next speaker of the Texas House of Representatives. But Alan West says the state GOP will neither support nor accept Phelan if Phelan has to rely on Democrats for any of that support. Finally, Republicans will keep a congressional seat in North Texas. Beth Van Dyne, the former mayor of Irving, is going to Congress. In the final vote count, Van Dyne defeated Candace Valenzuela. This is Congressional District 24, parts of northern Dallas and Tarrant counties. Van Dyne's going to replace Kenny Marchand, who is retiring from Congress. Turns out election season is not over, though. There is one more election next month, a special election, and we are paying close attention to it. This is for a state Senate seat, Drew Springer versus Shelley Luther. We had Springer on our program here a few weeks ago, so this morning, Shelley Luther is with us. She's the Dallas salon owner who made headlines for refusing to abide by those COVID lockdown restrictions earlier this year. State Senate District 30 stretches across the top of DFW from McKinney up to Sherman, over to Wichita Falls, and all the way down to Stephenville. And this race, as Shelley's about to say here, is particularly important because it's grassroots versus the establishment among Texas Republicans. Shelley, thank you for the time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Let's start with some news of the day here. Texas has now passed a million cases of the coronavirus and hospitals in, in El Paso and Lubbock and Amarillo are all at critical capacity there. What should the state government be doing going into the winter? I don't think the state government should be doing anything. I think that if there are cases in certain areas, there's not a blanket solution for anything. And we should leave um, those decisions up to the counties and the cities. They have a better idea of what's going on there. And someone in a state position does not have any idea what's going on there unless we're there every day. So I would leave it up to local governments for sure. Are you concerned at all about the cases of COVID might be getting worse as we go into the winter, Shelley? I mean, it's always a concern. Um, but like I said, there are um, many things to consider when it comes to that. And if people are concerned, they should stay home or um, do what they feel is right for them and their family. Voters will see you and Drew Springer on the ballot next month uh, there in the district. Well, what would you say is the clearest difference between you and your opponent? I'm just definitely not a politician. I, that, that is the hugest difference. I don't have any ties to Austin. I don't have any political PAC money. I don't have any lobbyist money. Um, my focus is on the people of Texas and especially the, my constituents in Senate District 30. And my decisions and what I do in Austin completely reflects their ideas. And I'm gonna vote as if I'm looking them straight in the eye. Why do, why do you think some of other state leaders uh, or, or other not state leaders, but other political uh, elected officials ha have clashed with you over this? These are other Republicans that, that I saw the, the famous video on Facebook. I don't know how famous it is, but I saw the video on Facebook uh, of you clashing with another uh, elected official um, over this. And it, it seems to me like there's a rift inside the Republican Party. 
There definitely is. And it's it's the establishment versus the grassroots. And um, the establishment in Austin and in Washington that President Trump is fighting. But um, in Austin, they've got their set ways. It's a good old boy system. And they don't want someone coming in who um, is not going to agree with everything that they say and is going to stand up for the people. And so there's a little ripple effect going on where um, I'm almost positive most of them do not want me there because I'm going to buck the system. Wouldn't that be hard to actually get things done, though, if, if you couldn't build a majority around legislation that you wanted passed? You know what? I'm willing to work with anybody. And I know Governor Abbott was asked the same question. If I were to be a senator, would he work with me? He said he would work with anybody. I think the biggest problem is the Republican platform has been the same for many sessions. And it seems like we keep adding all these tiny bills, but not going after the really big choices that... Um, you know, Senate District 30 for sure is wanting. And so I'm just going in there to make sure that there's transparency, clarity, and that the politicians who say they're doing something in Austin uh, or who say they're doing something, you know, in their district are actually taking care of those things in Austin. I wanted to ask you about the, um, the, the, the campaign as well, too, because you had uh, significantly more money than Drew Springer had, who is your opponent in the runoff. Uh, in the end, though, there were only 164 votes that separated separated you two. Did, did What do you think happened? Did you do something wrong, something you would have done differently? And, and what's your strategy moving forward? Absolutely not. Um, I, You know, Drew Springer was campaigning for at least six months before I was. Um, they knew about that seat opening early. And um, he has, I think, four counties that he's already representing that are in our current SD30 district. So he won those. But I feel like I won. I think I won all of the other counties. And I was only given about 30 days to campaign. And a lot of people don't know that I'm the salon owner. They they know if I introduce myself as Shelly Luther, they say, oh, nice to meet you. And I say, I'm the salon owner who, you know, went against the shutdown. People instantly know who I am and are backing me. So I, I think it's just name recognition. And we need to make sure that people know that I'm the one that stood up and I'll, st I'll stand up in Austin. All right, Shelly, thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And now to the public health issue that is likely in need of a political response. COVID cases are increasing in Texas as we close in on the winter months. In Dallas County, County Judge Clay Jenkins said there could be 2,000 new cases of the virus each day by Thanksgiving, less than two weeks away. El Paso, Amarillo, and Lubbock all facing critical situations in those cities. Governor Abbott has let local officials handle this in the past sometimes, and any yanks back authority. So what should we expect this time? Let's ask Ross Ramsey, the co-founder and executive editor of the Texas Tribune in Austin. Good morning to you, Ross. Good morning. How are you, Jason? Uh, doing well here. You know, talk to us about the politics around this. Should Texans prepare for more shutdowns? And is, is Governor Abbott going to allow that? You know, the governor's back where he was in April or in July, trying to decide, you know, where to fall in the balance between public health uh, personal rights and keeping the economy going. And all of the medical signs are that the coronavirus is about to peak at a level it hasn't reached in Texas before this. And, you know, the places that you point out are all asking for local restrictions. Uh, I would expect the governor will allow some local restrictions before he does anything statewide. Mm. In the middle of all this, Ross is planning for the next legislative session, which begins in January and bill filing is already open. State lawmakers can can uh, file their bills for that session. But we're, we're not yet clear on what the session is actually going to look like, whether lawmakers will meet on the floor, especially the House. Um, just curious, what, what do you expect? Because you've watched many of these. You know, other states, I've been looking at other states to see what they're doing, and they're all over the place. Uh, Texas is looking at uh, cutting the number of people in the Capitol building. Uh, trying to limit exposure in committee rooms that are kind of tight and the halls between them that are kind of tight. Actually, the floor of the House and the floor of the Senate are kind of easy to solve compared to the other problems. But really, it comes down to how do you conduct a legislative session and accept public testimony at a time when you've got a pandemic? Hmm. Something we'll be watching. Ross, back to you in a moment. Thank you. Coming up, what happened in Harris County this month likely changed elections forever in Texas. In just a moment, we'll talk with a 34-year-old interim clerk from Houston about what he now wants to do statewide. And speaking of elections, the former Republican state rep who abolished straight ticket voting, he has some thoughts on what he did. Ron Simmons is with us when we return. You're watching Inside Texas Power.
In the end, Joe Biden got two thirds of the vote in the Rio Grande Valley, places like McAllen and Harlingen and Brownsville there in the southern tip of Texas. But Republicans, they have been eating into that margin there for several years now. What's going on? Political scientists and grassroots, grassroots groups have taken notice of this historic shift and they have some ideas of what both political parties, what they need to be doing moving forward. All this is the latest episode of Yolitics. If your phone is handy, you can grab this political podcast right now for the weekend. Open your phone's camera, aim it at the QR code there on the right side of your screen. It will take you directly to this episode. Yolitics is the name of our political podcast and we drop new episodes every Tuesday. Now to what happened in Harris County. Voting this month was easier than ever before there, and it looked and it felt different. There was drive through voting, 24 hour polls and strategically placed voting centers. The 34 year old interim clerk in Harris County is Chris Hollins. He enacted these changes, courts upheld them, and they are likely to change the way Texans vote from now on. Hey, Chris, thanks for the time, man. Good to see you again. Absolutely. Good to see you as well, Jason. You made a lot of changes there in Harris County, the drive through voting, the 24 hour voting centers, uh, strategically placing voting centers as well. I'm just curious. So looking back now, do you wish you would have done anything differently? Uh, I don't. Uh, you know, we followed our plan uh, and our plan was ensure it was to ensure that people could cast their votes safely and to do so conveniently and with the peace of mind that their votes are going to be counted. And uh, and we did that. And I think a lot of the pushback that we received uh, actually had the effect of, of motivating voters and making it more likely that voters turned out. And so we were astounded to see the record numbers here in Harris County. Uh, and as we move to an election administrator now, uh, I'm, I'm excited that we're going to leave our legacy here in Harris County and hopefully spread it throughout Texas. Well, I want to talk to you about the legacy as well, too, since you will not be running the next election there in Harris County. How do you ensure that these changes become permanent? Yeah, well, uh, we appointed a, a really fantastic election administrator here in Harris County. Isabel Longoria was a senior member of my team. Uh, she's seen everything uh, that we've done uh, with her own eyes. And in fact, you know, she was the brains behind a lot of the operation. And so I don't think we have any any real uh, issues here in Harris County. But across Texas, you know, I'm going to be doing the work uh, to go to Austin. Uh, to try and affect legislation that will make voting easier for all Texans. Uh, and I'll be available to any election administrator in Texas or otherwise uh, who would like to copy any of the work that we've done here. And, and to that end, you mentioned going to Austin and trying to, to expand this. What kind of, of state laws would you like to see passed? Uh, well, you know, there's already been uh, something filed around drive through voting, uh, looking to formalize that uh, in Texas law. Uh, but on the opposite side, there's already been a bill filed to try and make sure that county clerks and election administrators cannot send out vote by mail applications. Uh, and so that's that's absurd. But there are some other just small uh, things that affect the lives of election administrators and their staffs that ultimately affect uh, you know voter habits. And we want to just work to to bring together common sense legislation that Republicans and Democrats can agree on that will ultimately uh, help the citizens of Texas. Chris, as a Democrat, uh, I want to ask you about the election because it's you know well known now the Texas Democratic Party oversold and underdelivered. As a Democrat, though, what kind of advice would you give your party about how it approaches 2022 and 2024? Um, you know, the only thing that matters is, is the final number, right? And when you lose an election, you have to go back and, and rethink your strategy. Uh, you know, it's clear that, you know, for one, you saw record turnout across Texas right. uh, and Democrats, you know, closed the margin. And there's been a steady closing of the margin all the way back since uh, Obama 2012. Uh, so that was positive. But of course, you know, if you think about the expectations game, uh, they're, you know, we, we did not win. We did not flip the state. And, and so more work needs to be done to expand the base, uh, to share a narrative that more Texans uh, are inspired by and can get behind at the, at the ballot box. All right. Chris Allen's good to talk to you again. All right. Have a good one. One thing that voters did not see on their ballot was straight ticket voting. That one punch option where you could vote for every Democrat or for every Republican. A former state rep named Ron Simmons got that abolished, and he's been watching to see just how effective it was. 
Ron is with us right now with a report card, a fairly high tech report card you have there. Ron, good to see you again, man. And uh, tell us how this worked, because that's something that, that a lot of people wondered is whether people would still vote down ballot and vote for those, you know, uh, school bonds and things like that. Absolutely. And that's a great question, uh, Jason. Good to be with you today. You know, we passed this bill in 2017 to be effective in 2019. It was a support supported by an overwhelming majority in both the House and the Senate. And of course, the governor signed it as well. But the question really comes down to where the rubber beat the road. And my thought was that people would vote down the ballot if the candidates did their job, if they went out and they canvassed and they and they talked to people and all of that even and even in the pandemic yeah. it really worked out well as you can see right here in 2016 three percent was a three percent drop off from the top of the ticket down to the lowest statewide which is court of appeals in 2020 it was only 3.4 percent so having straight ticket voting in 16 versus not having it 20 did not make a difference a little bit more interesting is that Republicans did a little bit better. And in 2016, there was actually a 2% increase at the bottom of the ticket over the presidential race, and the Democrats were at 8%. But in 2020, the Democrats actually did better down the bottom of the ticket than they did in 2016, only a 6% drop off. And Dallas County, which is a heavily Democrat county, yeah. if you talk about here at the bottom, they did exceptionally well also. So the Look. it worked out just like I hoped it would and thought it would and it had in other states, and that is voters will vote down the ballot. In Dallas County, President Trump only got 39% of the vote, but yet Morgan Meyer and Angie Button both won. Same thing happened in the Valley for Democrats. And yeah, and, and Morgan Meyer and Angie Chin Button were, of course, in close races in Dallas County. Uh, I, I want to ask you, but before we uh, before we have to let you go here about uh, the race for 2022 and 2024 beginning, a lot of people always asking, is Ron Simmons going to make a comeback? Do you have aspirations for political office again? Well, I'm enjoying my time. Uh, the governor's appointed me to a couple of things that I'm helping him with, and I'm doing a little think tank work. But uh, I always leave an open door. And if there's an opportunity where I believe I could serve the state of Texas, whether it's at the local level or statewide, I'd definitely be interested in that. Jason. Thank uh, you. All right, Ron. Good to see you again. We'll check in with you from time to time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jason. Have a good day. Thank you. There is a public fight unfolding among Texas Republicans. Alan West, the party chairman, says he will not support Dade Phelan to become the next Speaker of the House. We're going to get into the politics behind all of that next on the round team. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Back with us is Ross Ramsey from the Texas Tribune and joining us each week, Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and Bernadine Steptoe, the political producer at WFAA in Dallas. Ross, we'll start with you and the ongoing election. It seems like Republicans, it doesn't seem like it, it is. Republicans are scared to death to say anything. Alan West, one of the very few uh, coming out and saying anything critical about President Trump, saying if he, you know, the results aren't what they are, then he needs to step aside. He's still here for 60 days and he still wields power for 60 days. So that's one thing. The other is that, you know, there's not a lot of distance between their voters and Donald Trump. The voters like mm -hmm. Donald Trump and they risk crossing Donald Trump at the peril of losing some of their voters. Yeah, and Buddy's right. Not, not a lot of distance. I would say there's no distance, right? Right. I mean, and anger is what Republicans have going right now. And if you're a Republican and you're not angry, then the other voters are going to want to know why you have to be angry about about the election. You have to be angry about Joe Biden. You know, uh, you know the other all the other Republican office holders, uh, you know, if they step aside, they risk looking weak. That's a good point. Bernadine, when Ross was talking to her, you say yes. Well, yes, because what harm is it causing to allow President Trump to take the time that he wants? Everyone knows, all Republicans, everyone knows that on January the 20th, he will no longer be president. So why not give him, give him the time? And keep in mind, he did get almost 6 million votes in Texas. So they're on, they're on a good side, uh, allowing him to take the time that he wants. That's not a, not a bad argument, Bud and Ross. No, I think that works. I think that's exactly it. You know, the voters are there, so the politicians are there.
I want to uh, flip back to uh, the Texas legislature. Ross, you and I talked about this a moment ago. Uh, we talked about what it might look like during the COVID pandemic, which will still be ongoing, obviously, in January. But I want to ask about the, the next Speaker of the House, because uh, Dade Phelan from Beaumont, state rep there, says he has the votes to become the next Speaker. Alan West, again, the state party uh, Republican chairman, uh, says that, no, you, you cannot rely on any, any Democrats at all for that. It seems like this is a pretty public fight. Why is that? Well, you know, the, the party's arguing for party control of the legislature. That's not how the Texas legislature works. It's a bipartisan House. It's actually a bipartisan Senate. The speaker has to have Democratic votes to get elected. More importantly, he has to have Democratic votes to get anything done in the legislative session. And somebody shooting at him from the right is probably good for his politics inside the House. Yeah, that's a good point. Bud, uh, Alan West doesn't have a vote in this. What's his long game here? Well, Chairman Chairman West is from the, the the what we used to call the Tea Party faction of of the party, and, and also this party is very influenced by the gun rights groups who want uh, what they call constitutional carry. They want everybody to be able to carry a gun. Uh, they've tried to undermine Speaker Bonin. Now they're already trying to undermine Speaker Phelan. Uh, they're they're going to continue to be angry and and uh, tear away at everybody until they get constitutional carry. And Bernadine, what does that say about the state of the Republican Party in Texas right now? They've undermined Dennis Bonham's why he's not here anymore, and they're trying to do the same, it looks like, with uh, Dade Phelan before he's even elected. Well, it shows that that part of the faction of the Republican Party is not going away. But keep in mind, what uh, Chairman West is doing is not new. Remember during Strauss's time, they had, they asked what it was the Texas Freedom Caucus who was putting out saying that you needed to sign a form supporting the speaker to get only a Republican votes. It's nothing new. And it just shows that the grassroots are not going away. And those are the voters are a part of the Republican party that put West in office. Yeah. So and he's just, yeah. So he's just, he's just walking their line. And, and President Trump as well, too. Guys, thank you so much. Yes. We appreciate it. Thank you for watching as well. We're back again next Sunday with more Inside Texas Politics. Hope to see you then. Until then, be safe out there.